Um, so today we're learning all about our cartilaginous fish. So our sharks, skates, and our rays. Um, so anytime we talk about an animal, I love to start really, really broad. And then based on its characteristics, we can narrow it down till we get to a specific species. So whenever you have an animal, the first question you want to ask yourself, is it a vertebrate or an invertebrate? And what those two, two words mean, a vertebrate is an animal with a backbone, and an invertebrate is an animal without a backbone. So if you're not sure what a backbone is, you can take your hand, put it in the middle of your back, rub up and down. You guys feel that bumpy thing? Yeah, that's a backbone. So we are vertebrates. Now we have five major groups of vertebrates in the world. We have mammals, birds, fish, reptiles, and amphibians. So everything else is gonna be an invertebrate. And a fun fact, if we were to actually collect all of the invertebrates on land, in the air, in the ocean, and then put them on a scale, and we were to collect all the vertebrates on land, in the air, in the ocean, put them on a scale, it would actually, the biomass of the invertebrates would be so much more than the vertebrates. And that's because, think about it, when you see a cat, do you see one cat or do you see thousands of cats running around? Usually just one, right? Now, if we see, especially here in Florida, fire ants, do we see one or do we see hundreds of them crawling up your leg trying to bite you? It's definitely the hundreds trying to bite you and it's not very fun. So there are just so many more invertebrates um, size-wise because they're smaller. So when we are to collect them all and weigh them, it would actually be way more than all of our things with backbones. So I did tell you that those five major groups um, of vertebrates, one of them is going to be fish and that's who we're focusing on today. Um, so fish are really cool. They are actually the most diverse out of all vertebrates. So they have over 33,000 identified species. Um, so these guys, they can be found in fresh water, they can be found in salt water, and then they can be found in brackish water. Now brackish water is going to be that mixture of fresh and salt. So usually where a river releases into the ocean. So like a bay or an estuary. Um, they all have some common characteristics that make this animal a fish. Um, so they live in water, right? Uh, they also have gills. They are ectothermic, and we'll, I'll talk about that word in a moment. They have a swim bladder, they have fins, their skin is covered in scales, and they have at least six senses. Um, now, if we were to compare that to mammals, which is what we are, we don't live in the water, right? We live on land. We breathe using lungs, not gills. We are endothermic, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, we have appendages like arms and legs, and our skin is covered in hair or fur, right? And we only have five senses. So ectothermic and endothermic, they're just big fancy words for cold-blooded or warm-blooded. So ectothermic, like our fish here, that means they're cold-blooded. So what that means is that their internal temperature is going to be doing whatever the external temperature or outside temperature is doing. So especially here in Florida, we get like four cold days in the wintertime. And it's not that cold, but it's relatively cold for us because we're babies at this point. But when it does get cold, when it cools off at nighttime, We'll see, in the morning, we'll see our snakes and our gators and our lizards and our iguanas sunning themselves, getting nice and warm so that they can get their body temperatures up and then start their day. Now that is way different from us, right? Because when we get cold, our body's like, I got this, watch this, and it starts shivering, right? So as you get cold and you shiver, that's actually your body's way of trying to generate heat. And right now, as I'm in hot, sunny Florida, I'm getting too hot and my body's like, I got you, Carly, look at this response. And I'm actually starting to sweat. So as I sweat, and then that sweat evaporates off of my body, it actually cools me off. So our temperature as endotherms or as warm-blooded mammals, we stay at a certain degree, 98.6-ish, give or take. And any if we fluctuate up or down, our body's going to have a response to get us back to that 98.6, because that's where we like to be at. So for our fish, we actually have three major groups within the fish uh, uh, category. So we have the most ancient, which are going to be our jawless fish. So if you look at this kind of scary photo on the top left, uh, that is going to be our jawless fish. Then we have our cartilaginous fish. So our shark skates and our rays. And we'll talk about what makes them a cartilaginous fish. And then we have our bony fish or the osteichthyes. So these guys are going to be the most common type of fish. So if you're out in the water, especially here in Florida, they're all silver basically, unless you're out on the reef. Um, so all of the fish that we're kind of used to, that's gonna fall into our bony fish category. But since we are talking about the cartilaginous fish today, we're only gonna focus on them. Um, and it, I'll touch really briefly on the sharks, or sorry, excuse me, I'll touch really briefly on the skates and the rays, and then we'll get into the good stuff, which are the sharks. So if you guys are ready, we're gonna keep on rolling. Um, so again, there are just some common characteristics that make a cartilaginous fish a cartilaginous fish. Omri, yes, that photo. I go back one if you want to. There we go. This photo right here was a tiger shark. Good eye. 
um, that has those prominent stripes, just like a tiger. Scientists, we're not very creative with them. Sometimes we are creative with the names, but sometimes we're just like, to the point, this is what it is. So good eye. Uh, so one thing about the cartilaginous fish is that they've actually been around in the ocean for millions of years. So sharks have been around for over 450 million years and skates and rays have been around for about 150 million years. Um, skates and rays are often referred to uh, as like pancake sharks just because they are very similar, but they're just flat and we'll talk about some of their adaptations. So the thing that sets these guys apart from the bony fish is what their skeletons are made out of. So they actually have cartilaginous skeleton. Um, so we have cartilage on our bodies. Does anybody want to type in the chat where they think us humans have cartilage in our bodies? I'll give you a hint. Oh, ear. Good job, Omri. Yep. So if you touch your ear, you know how it's kind of bendy but kind of stiff? Yeah, so that's actually made out of cartilage. Um, anybody else know? Oh, Kay, uh, Kyla, good job. Nose. So your nose is the other one. So if you kind of wiggle your nose, like down towards the point of your nose, it's hard, but it's also kind of soft at the same time. So that's cartilage. So we do have cartilage uh, in our bodies, but our bones are made up of calcium, right? And just like our bony fish, that's what theirs is going to be made out of. But for our chondrichthys, for our cartilaginous fish, their entire skeletons are made out of cartilage, which is really cool. Now, one of the crazy things with cartilage is that it doesn't really stay preserved in the fossil record. So how do we know these guys have been around for forever? And it's actually their teeth. So their teeth are calcified. So their teeth are similar to our bones and we find their fossils and their jaws and even their vertebrae, their backbone, um, those are all calcified and that's how we find them in the fossil record. Um, so they are fish, they use gills to breathe. So they have at least five gills. And we'll talk about um, little modifications later on. They have dermal denticles. So that is the type of scales on their skin. And we'll talk about that in a moment as well. These guys, unlike bony fish, they do not have a swim bladder. So swim bladder is basically a balloon. It's an organ inside the fish. And all it does, it helps kind of control where the fish is in the water column. Because you guys know if you put floats on your arm and you hop in a pool, you're going to stay up at the surface, right? Now, if you were to take the floats off, you would probably sink down to the bottom of the pool. So that's swim bladder. If they inflate it, the fish can go up in the water column. And if they deflate it, they can go down in the water column. Sharks were like, we don't want that. We got something else. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And then these guys, they just have rows of teeth that are constantly being replaced compared to us, right? We have baby teeth and we have adult teeth. So once we hit a certain age, our baby teeth fall out, our adult teeth come in, and then that's all we got. So if we knock one of those out, we get in trouble. These guys, they just have rows that are consistently being replaced. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So on the top left, we have a ray. Where's my clicker? There it is. Top left, we have a ray. Right here, we have a thresher shark, which is one of the coolest sharks in the ocean, I think, but I'm also very biased. And then down here, we have a skate. Um, so we're just going to highlight our skates really quick, and then we'll talk about our rays, and then we'll keep going. So skates and rays are very similar. Like I said, they are like pancake sharks, so they're just flattened. Um, and they have these flat bodies with wing-like pectoral fins, so uh, kind of where our shoulders would be. Um, they have strong teeth and jaws to chomp on their prey. Now they differ from rays because they don't have a barb. Uh, so if we look at their tail, it's just a tail right here. That's it, no barb like a stingray. Um, and they love to eat crustaceans and mollusks. So crustaceans will include our crabs, our lobsters, our shrimp, so animals with that hard exoskeleton. So they do need some strong teeth and jaws to chomp open that exoskeleton. And mollusks, so that'll include some snails. Again, they have that hard shell protecting that soft body. Some squid, uh, some bivalves, so our clams, scallops, mussels, and oysters. So these guys are really cool. So they use gills to breathe. So that means water needs to pass over them. And most fish need to swim in order to breathe, right? They have to keep moving so that the water keeps flowing. These guys were like, nah, we're gonna try something else. And they have this really cool adaptation because look, their gills are on the bottom, right? So do you think it would be super fun to be sitting on the bottom and having sand pass over your breathing mechanism? Do you think that would be enjoyable? Nah, it wouldn't be fun. It would be like when we inhale dust, right? And then you start coughing and you're like, oh my gosh, everything hurts. Why did I eat that sand again? So these guys actually have spiracles. So it's actually on the top, so right here, behind their eye. And what it does, it allows them to stay sedentary. It allows them to rest on the bottom and still pump water over their gills so that they can breathe. So that's a really cool adaptation because 
they're at like, I'd say middle to lower end of the food web. So a lot of things like to eat them. So one of the things that they'll do is that they'll try to either bury a little bit underneath the sand to hide from their predators, or they can camouflage in the sand, depending on their color. Um, and that way they don't have to move, but they can keep breathing and then hopefully be like, all right, hammerhead shark, please pass me. You don't see me, right? Okay, good. And then they can keep going. So they actually swim, moving their wing-like fins, which is really cool. I might have a video. Sometimes videos are a little funky on Zoom, so I don't know if I kept it in this presentation. Um, and one of the cool things that they do is that they actually have egg cases. So if you guys, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these before, but if you look at the bottom left, this is called a mermaid's purse. Um, so I don't know if anyone's ever found them on the beach before, um, but they're actually, that's what the skate will lay its eggs in. So unlike, like, because as humans, we spend nine months in uh, the mother before we're born, right? The skates, they actually will put the eggs in this mermaid's purse. Um, so they have a yolk sac in there to give the babies nutrients. And then this usually will attach to a substrate, whether it's a rock, coral, a patch of algae, whatever. They'll leave it, and then mom's like, cool, see ya, and she takes off, right? And then after a certain amount of time, those begin to hatch. Um, because they are attached to things a lot of times with a lot of wave action, right? So especially now as we are in hurricane season here in Florida, as we get a lot more waves, that could kind of kick up the mermaid's purse. And then with all that um, storm action, pushing uh, all the debris from the ocean floor into the shore, that's where we find them. Um, so a lot of time, the best time to go look for anything cool is after a storm. Um, so definitely check it out if you can. But these are really cool because we actually do get these washed up uh, right here in Hollywood Beach. Um, this fact blew my mind because all the skates that I have seen have been maybe a foot or two. I haven't really seen huge ones, but they can grow to be about eight feet long, which is huge. I am a six foot human, which means that is larger than me, and that is a little frightening, but super cool at the same time. Um, but they could also be really small, so they could be about 30 inches as well. So it's really cool. They kind of range in size. All right, so that's our skates, and now we're going to compare our skates to our rays. So they're very similar, except one of the big differences is going to be their tail. Um, so if we look, where is my mouse? There it is. If we look at the top right here, so they have the same similar tail, but they have that barb on there. Um, so stingrays especially have that barb. They use that not, it's, it's not their favorite. If they can avoid their predators, they don't like confrontation, just like me. So if they can swim away, they're going to do it. It's kind of like, oh, I can't get away, but I do have to protect myself. And then they will uh, stick that barb. It's not pleasant. Um, I have not been stung by one knock on wood yet, but I, that's why I always do the stingray shuffle when I'm in the water uh, because fish have a lateral line. And we'll talk about that in a moment of why they can kind of figure out where you're gonna be and take off. So electric rays are really cool. They were like, we don't need that, we don't need that barb. They actually have electric organs on the side of their head and they can use that to shock their prey, which is really cool. I didn't know electric rays existed and I was uh, over on the west coast of Florida where it's the Gulf of Mexico so it's a little bit shallower so you can walk out for like 40 feet and you're maybe up to knee high water and I was following a ray because it was beautiful it's actually this ray right here that's not my photo but it looks just like it and I was like wow blue pretty I love pretty colors I'm following it I'm following it and one of my coworkers is like what are you doing and I'm like look at this ray I've never seen this before this is amazing and she's like yeah don't touch that and I was like why and she's like, that's an electric ray. And I was like, haha, yeah, right. And then I, we looked at, I didn't believe her, I should have, but I went up and looked it up later and it's so true. They could, so like if I were to have touched that, I would have gotten a little shock. Now, again, I am a six foot human, so it wouldn't hurt me that bad. It wouldn't feel pleasant, but it wouldn't hurt me. But to like a tiny fish or to a tiny crab, that's not gonna feel very pleasant. Um, also, manta rays. My new favorite animal. We just did uh, a presentation last week with um, a woman who studies manta rays. They're amazing. If you guys have free time, check out our YouTube channel because we record all those webinars and pop it up there. I could have spent this whole presentation just talking about them, but they are fantastic. They have to constantly swim to breathe. And what's really cool about them is that they are filter feeders. So we can see this bottom photo right here. So they have like these tiny, 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 like basically sandpaper teeth. They don't need it to chew their food because they're looking for those tiny microscopic organisms in the water called plankton. So like our whale sharks, um, like baleen whales as well, when they open their mouth as the water flows through, they can pick out those tiny particles. They also have that water flowing over their gills so that they can get the oxygen. And then they close their mouth when they're done. Uh, sawfish, these guys are really cool. 
Um, they're the funkiest looking fish I've ever, uh, one of the funkiest looking fish I've ever seen. Uh, but they have that really long rostrum and we can see all these little teeth coming off on the bottom left photo. Um, and they just use that to feed so they can impale their prey or they could use it for defense. Now these guys do a little, a little different of a birthing strategy. So we saw in the skates, they made this egg case. And for these guys, viviparous means live birth. So very similar to us, they'll, uh, baby manta ray will be hanging out in mom's stomach for a certain amount of time. And then she will give birth and it's not full grown, but it is quite large. Um, and it goes off and it does its baby manta ray thing. All right, now if anybody has any questions, feel free to drop it in the chat. I'm just gonna take a quick look. Missed anything? Oh, you've held an eagle ray. Right? Very cool. In Cuba, very cool. Nice. Carly, um, I'll just add here that yeah. uh, some of our participants who have done our junior marine biologist program before, so we did it the last two summers, have actually got to see and hold and tag skates. So some of them oh, are no actually, way. yeah, quite uh, familiar with skates. And I think there's probably quite a few girls because in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, it's really common to have the egg cases and the mermaid oh, purses wash up on the beach. So I'm oh, sure cool. there's quite a few girls that have seen that before. Cool. Oh, good. I wasn't sure. I was like, do they go that far north? I was like, I don't know if they wash up that far north. But very cool. Yeah. All right. So now we're getting to the best stuff. If we're ready. If it wants to go. There we go. So sharks, right? That's what we're all here for. We do love our skates and our rays, but realistically, we love the sharks. Um, these guys are really cool. They range in all sorts of sizes, and I'm going to kind of highlight some of the most important things, which I think is everything about them, but bear with me. Um, so for sharks, we have over 500 identified species of sharks. So the, lar the smallest shark is going to be the dwarf lantern shark. So if you look right here, so it's about the size of someone's hand, um, found in deep, 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 dark waters. And then the largest shark is going to be a whale shark. So if we flip back to here, this guy right here in the middle, um, they can grow to be about 43 feet long. So if you guys are familiar with American school buses, it's about that size. Um, so they can grow to be really big. And the thing that blows my mind is that they're the largest fish in the ocean, but they eat the smallest things in the ocean. Uh, so they eat that plankton. They eat those tiny microscopic organisms. So they've been around for over 450 million years. And like I said, the calcified teeth and backbone is how we have found them in the fossil record. So right here and their jaw as well. Um, so here is a really good example of a shark jaw. Um, also their vertebrae we can find and we can actually figure out how old a shark is based on that vertebrae. So if we were to get one piece, one vertebrae, it's very similar to a tree. So you know how we count the rings of a tree and we can figure out how old a tree is? Very similar for these guys as well. Um, also major things that happen um, specifically when, uh, during World War II, when the US dropped um, the atomic bombs, that actually was stored in some of the sharks in their vertebrae. So you can actually see it and then they can actually get an exact date, which is super cool. I tried finding a photo of it, but I couldn't find it. I think I have it somewhere saved on one of my, when I was a student, one of those presentations that I had to sit through. Um, but they're really cool. And most sharks are gonna be apex predators which means that they're at the top of the food chain. They're at the top of their food web. Nothing really goes after them. And they are very important because they actually maintain the entire uh, health of the food web. Because we know we have levels, right? Now, with anything, if you do too much, it's probably not good, right? So if we have too much seagrass growing or too much algae growing, that's going to uh, throw off the food web. So the sharks just kind of keep the big fish population in check which then keeps the little fish population in check, which keeps the crab population in check, which keeps the algae population in check. So nature is this super complex puzzle, but everything has a role, everything kind of fits. And anytime it's messed with, like we know, whenever you try to jam a puzzle piece where it's not supposed to fit, it doesn't look right, right? So just like with nature, anytime it gets tweaked or altered, there's gonna be effects somewhere. So sharks just kind of help keep that nice and functioning, keeps everything in check, which is really cool. Um, so they actually have seven senses. So we only have five as humans. So I feel like I'm a little left out and I'm a little upset, but I'm trying to work on the lateral line. It's just not working out for me. But they have the same five that we do. So they have touch, taste, smell, hearing, and sight. Um, so for touch and for taste, they obviously have to be in immediate contact. Um, so for touching, a lot of times they'll, especially if you hear anyone who encountered a shark, as in a kayak or a paddleboard or a surfboard, they always say, oh, I felt something bump up against me. Because they're just like, we don't have thumbs. I got to figure out what you are. So they bump up against just to figure out what's happening. And then sometimes they'll just do a little nibble just to be like, 
do I want to eat you? And when they take a bite of a human, they're like, oh, gross, high fructose corn syrup. I don't want that. And they spit us out because we're disgusting. They don't want to eat us. We, they just don't know what we are because we have legs. Now, the next really cool, this one is, uh, this one is only that the sharks and the skates in the raid have it. It's called ampullae of Lorenzini. So it's these tiny jelly-filled pores that cover their head and their snout. So if you guys can look at this top right photo, it looks like freckles, right? So it's all near their face. And what it does, it actually can detect electrical currents. Now, really quickly, if somebody wants to take a guess, what do you think in your body, so you have it right now, what do you think in your body gives off an electrical current? This one's a little tough, but you need it to survive. And you don't even have to think about using it. It just does it. Oh, I got some answers. Oh, Madeline. Yes. Heart. Excellent job. Nice. So every time your heart beats, it actually gives off this little electrical current. Um, so this is kind of like a built-in metal detector, more or less. Um, so remember how I told you those skates and those rays like to hide in the sand? Hammerhead sharks love eating stingrays. That's like their third favorite snack. So what they do, they take that big hammer head with all the ampullae of Lorenzini and they will go back and forth on the sand floor because they're like, I know I can detect your heartbeat, Stingray, I'm gonna find you. And they'll go and they'll go and they'll go. And then once they find it, they're like, oh, snack, yes. So they do have to be relatively close for that to work. So they can't be miles or kilometers apart and be like, oh, I can detect a heartbeat. They do have to be fairly close, just like with a metal detector if you ever use one in the sand. Now their sight, they have really good eyes. They can see up to 50 feet away or about 15 meters, but they cannot see color. Um, and one of the cool, they actually have two cool eyeball adaptations and you might be familiar with some of them. Um, if you guys have deer, cats, any sort of animal up uh, by you guys. But if you guys have ever been out at nighttime and your car light or your flashlight, all of a sudden you see two eyes shining back at you, right? So that is gonna be the tapetum lucidum, AKA a Harry Potter spell. Um, but tapetum lucidum is that eye shine. So that's what helps our animals see at nighttime. Uh, so it helps them have good nocturnal vision. And they also have this thing called a nictitating membrane. So if anybody has cats, they also have it. Um, so it is acts as a shield for their eye. So if you can look right here on the bottom right photo, see this eye, how it's mostly covered in white? That's that nictitating membrane. So they do it a lot of times when they go to bite because they can't then take their fins and cover their eyes, right? They can't cover their eyes like us. So what they do, that little membrane covers their eyes as they take a bite so nothing pokes them in the eye, which is really cool. Well, I got some questions maybe. Do they see in black and white or just shapes and shadows? They can see in black and white. Uh, their eyesight is very good. They just don't have the rods like we do to see color or like mantis shrimp, which can see like, I think it's like 16 different colors. Like we don't even know what they can see because it's so much more advanced than us. All right, so the next thing, and now this lateral line. So all fish have this. So our bony fish, our jawless fish, and our cartilaginous fish have it. So all fish will have six senses. Cartilaginous fish, they have that ampullae of Lorenzini, which makes them have seven. So the lateral line, it's actually on the inside. So if we look right here on the top right photo, this running down, so basically it's just, it's inside their body and it allows them to detect pressure in the water so they can detect movement. So has, the best example of this is if you've ever gone into the water and there's a school of fish, right? And they're all circling, right? And it's not like they're talking to each other being like, hey, two strokes of your pectoral fins then turn left, right? They're not doing that. Or if you go to reach for a fish with your hand, as you move through the water, all of a sudden the fish takes off, right? Because they can detect that movement. So that lateral line, this is what sharks will use because they, don't tell anyone I'm telling you this, but they are lazy. They are so lazy. They don't want to work hard for their food. And that's why oftentimes they're going something that's injured or dying or old. Now, if you are injured, are you calm, cool, and collected, or are you a little panicky? I'm like super panicky if I ever get hurt. Yes. Yeah. So if you're in the water, if an animal gets hurt, a lot of times they're going to be thrashing because they're like, oh no, something's wrong. What do I do? Now sharks are like, hey, I can feel that because they can feel that from up to 100 meters away. So like 330-ish feet. And then they're like, oh, that's something that's distressed. I'm not going to have to work hard for that. I'm going to go see what it is. And then they're going to go figure it out. And if they can catch it, they're going to eat it. Now their next sense, of, uh, next sense is going to be their sense of smell. And what's really cool, so the olfactory, that's a big fancy word for smelling, but their brain, two thirds of their brain is dedicated to smelling. They can smell up to half a kilometer away. And just to break it down even more, they can detect one part of blood 
in a million parts of water, which is insane. I don't have a very good sense of smell, so I think mine is mostly jealousy, uh, but it, they are so good at smelling. So that's why a lot of times when an animal does get hurt, if it does bleed, not only can the shark detect their thrashing movement, they're like, you smell that? I smell a snack. I don't have to work hard. Boop, and they'll swim over. But their best sense is actually going to be their hearing. Um, just a lot of it has to do with the fact that sound does travel better, better in water than air travels about four times faster, and they can hear something up to a kilometer away, which is really far. And again, if you are injured, you're not calm, cool, and collected, right? You're like a demogorgon. Oh my gosh, Kyla, yes. Stranger things, I like it. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, so it's, it's kind of cool how they'll use all three of these senses at once if they're far away from an animal that's injured. All right, moving and grooving. So some of their body adaptations. So we had said that all sharks, or sorry, all fish have that swim bladder, right? That built-in balloon that allows them to go up and down, up and down. Sharks were like, no, I don't want it. So sharks actually do not have it. So how do they control, control their buoyancy? And it's actually their liver. So on the inside, in their, their internal organ, their liver can actually account for about 25% of their total body weight. And in that liver has a lot of oils and fats. Now, if you guys have ever put oil in water, it separates, right? The oil will go up to the top, the water will stay below it. Um, so those oils and fats of the livers give that shark the buoyancy. So that's what allows them to go up and down, plus their tail, which we'll talk about in a moment. Another thing, they are constantly losing teeth. So they have functional teeth, so that's gonna be that front row of teeth, and that's what they use to chew, to bite, all that good stuff. And then they have those replacement teeth. Um, so that's gonna be behind the functional teeth, and then whenever those functional teeth fall out, the replacement teeth are like, all right, here I am, and they slide on down. So it kind of depends on the shark, how many rows of teeth they'll have. They can have anywhere from five to 15, but again, depends on the shark. Um, so they can lose up to 35,000 teeth in a lifetime. Now that's just a guess because these guys, they live for a really long time and sharks don't hang out in groups necessarily. They like to kind of roam by themselves and a lot of them are gonna be out in the open ocean. And that's kind of hard for humans to get out and to consistently study. Um, so it's just an estimate about 35,000, but I would assume it's a little bit more. Also depending on how hungry the shark is. Um, what's really cool, if you do find a shark teeth, cause we can actually see from just the examples that I have here, they all look different, right? And that's because they all specialize eating different things. So their teeth, the shape and the size can reflect their diet. Um, does anybody want to take a guess of what any of these teeth are from? What shark? Anybody want to take a guess? We mentioned, I think it was Omri mentioned the one shark earlier in the beginning of the slide. It's like a cat. It's fierce. Yeah, tiger shark. So if we look right here on the bottom right, this is going to be our tiger shark tooth. So not only is it super sharp, look how all the jagged mark or serrated edges to it. So those teeth are used for tearing into things. Um, up here, these kind of scary looking teeth, uh, this is actually from a nurse shark. So nurse sharks are really cool. Uh, they actually like to rest on the bottom of the ocean floor. Uh, they also, so like I said, most sharks have to swim to breathe. These guys were like, no, no, we also have those spiracles, like our skates and our rays. So they'll hang out on the bottom and they'll pump water over their gills. Uh, they have these teeth. They love to eat crustaceans. So they just need teeth uh, sharp enough to crack open uh, those hard shells to get the soft body animals on the inside. Uh, Madeline says, is the small one from a great white? Madeline, what small one are you talking about? The full left or the middle? Middle. Ooh, good guess. It is not, but what about this one right here? Do you think this one's from a great white? Yeah, so the left side, that's actually going to be the great white. So they have that really, um, I always associate shark teeth with this. I don't know why great whites are the only teeth that I think of, but I always think of that really triangular, super serrated on the edge, again, just to kind of help tear into their prey. I didn't write down, I want to say this one's a mako shark. I'm not 100% sure. I didn't write it down. Ooh, lemon shark, maybe. It might be lemon shark. I, I, I'll go for it. I like sea cucumbers, so I, they only have five teeth. I don't have to worry about them. <laughs> 500 species of teeth is just too much for me, but I'll have to double check on this. I know I have it somewhere. I just, I didn't put it in my notes, unfortunately. But so we can see those four different species, they have four different teeth. 
four different types of teeth because they all specialize on eating different things. So another thing, um, so their body shape really helps them swim. Um, so if we look here, they're super streamlined. So they got an elongated fusiform body, which basically means it prevents them from having drag, allows them to be more hydrodynamic, and they don't have to use as much energy to swim. Um, so dermal denticles, so that's the type of scales that are covering their skin. And they're actually made, so dermal, if we go to the dermatologist, we're talking about our skin. And denticles, if we think of the dentist, we're talking about our teeth, right? So scientists, even though they use big fancy words, they always put clues in there. As long as we can break down the word, we can figure out what they're trying to say. So this is actually a photo of those dermal denticles of their skin zoomed in. So for my friends who did tag the skates and the rays, did you guys pet them by any chance? Did you touch them when you were, uh, or if anyone has ever pet a shark before? Um, do you guys remember what it felt like? Was it smooth? Was it slimy? Was it squishy? Was it bumpy? Was it rough? Did it feel like cotton candy? Abby says no. Hannah, you've pet a skate before. What did the skate feel like? Do you remember? I know it was a few summers ago. It felt slimy. And then slimy? what else did it have on the back? Do you remember it had a few really big spikes on it? Oh yeah, on its like tail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not as noticeable in the skates and rays, I think, compared to sharks. But if you, we were to pet a shark right now, it would actually feel like sandpaper. So one way would feel pretty smooth. If we went from head to tail, it would feel smooth. So if we look on the top right, so see how the points are coming on the left side of these scales? So if we went from the head, let's say the head was over here on the right side of this photo, and we pet down to the tail, it would feel nice and smooth. Now, if we went from the tail and pet up to the head, see all those spikes coming out? Do you think it would feel smooth? Nope, Nicole, you are so right. It would not, it would actually feel like sandpaper. Um, so it's kind of like when you pet a cat from their tail to their head and they're like, you're doing it wrong, please stop. It's kind of like that. Um, so these are really cool. It allows, so because um, the way that these scales kind of overlap, it allows the shark to be more streamlined in the water as well. Again, kind of prevents drag. Um, really cool, they're actually doing research, um, trying to mimic the dermal denticles uh, for wetsuits, uh, for surfers. I don't know about swimmers because I feel like that's got to be cheating, but I don't know. I don't make the rules, uh, but they're actually trying to figure out a way that we can make something, a material, whether it's neoprene or somehow make our own dermal denticles to help swimmers or to help those wetsuits make people more streamlined in the water and counter shading. So this is a really cool form of camouflage. So basically what it means is that this photo does a great job of showing it. If the top part of the animal, so if we look right here in the middle on the Right here, we see that defining line, right? We see darkness on the top, and then it's light on the bottom. Now that's for a reason. Let's say we're swimming on top above this shark, right? And this shark is below us. And I look down into the deep, deep, deep dark ocean, and the dark body is uh, what I'm gonna see. Do you think that shark's gonna stand out, or do you think it's gonna blend in with the dark, dark bottom? And you guys can type your answer in the chat. anybody wants to take a guess? Blend in. Good job, Amri. Absolutely. It's going to blend in. Now, let's say I decided to free dive and I dove down to the bottom to see if I could find an octopus. And as I'm, and there's a shark above me, not coming after me, but just swimming because it's the ocean. It's his home. And I look up and that white belly is up at the top of the surface where the sun is shining in. Do you think it's going to blend in? Yeah, Abigail. Absolutely. Oh, Amri, it actually will blend in. Oh, no, you're not going to scream and run away. You guys should be more afraid of your kitchen toaster than a shark and window blinds and playgrounds and barbecue grills. I could keep going. There's so many things. Um, so this is a really good way for a shark to kind of camouflage, um, use their body to either avoid predators if they're a smaller shark or if they're a larger shark, kind of sneak up on their prey item. All right. And now the, one of the last things are their fins. Um, so their fins really help provide stability and balance in the water. So it's very similar to an airplane. Um, so those pectoral fins, so the ones we see in the front, so right, oh shark, you're moving too fast for me. Look at that mako shark right there. So it just kind of provides them um, direction and then can kind of help with the lift, just like an airplane flies. And then the caudal or the tail fin, that's the most important fin on this shark. Um, and that's what propels them through the water. So most sharks have uh, the upper part of the caudal fin is longer, 
So just like this thresher shark right here, see how that top part? Now that's excessively long. They're usually not that long. But these guys have that really elongated caudal fin. And you can see it's actually using that to stun their prey. So see how it flips it over its head to stun their prey and then to gobble up the snacks. I'm going to scoot back to this slide really quick just so we can see. Um, so just comparing some of the tails. So we see the top part of the tail on the great white is longer than the bottom part. Same with our mega mouth, same with our thresher shark, um, same with our spiny dogfish, our black tip, our lemon sharks. So most sharks do have that. There are some that don't. Um, like the salmon shark, it's basically the same size. And again, that just has to do with where it likes to hang out um, and its role in the ecosystem. So it all kind of depends. It's just one of those cool adaptations that all sharks have. All right. And Carly, that slide that you just showed us with yeah. the mako and the thresher. Yes. So for all of our girls that are calling in from the east coast of Canada, we have both threshers and mako sharks in waters oh. off of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick yeah. and Newfoundland. And for all of you that are panicking about, oh my God, I would be so scared. Sharks are not interested in us. I promise you, they no. don't care. No. But they are cool to know that they are around, I think anyways. Oh yeah, absolutely. And if a shark is in your ecosystem, that's great news. That means that the ecosystem is healthy enough to sustain them. Um, so, and then they're keeping the rest of it in check. So if you have sharks, that's fantastic. Um, we don't need to be afraid of them. They, like we just said, they want nothing to do with us. They're just kind of like, what are you? They just don't know what we are. Cause you know, we don't live in the ocean, right? We visit it, but we're not there all the time. So when they do stumble upon us, they're just like, what? What is that? So they just, and they just try to figure out what we are. Um, so this mako shark right here, they are actually one of the coolest sharks. They can get up anywhere from like 35 miles an hour to 50, 50 miles per hour speed wise. Most sharks kind of cruise at like 10 to 15, but these guys are so fast. Um, and the reason they're able to stay uh, to go so fast is that they're a little bit different. So they're they can actually keep their body temperatures warmer than most sharks, and that's something that we can talk about at another time, because I know I am running out of time. I want to get your questions, but sharks just have so many adaptations. How do you just pick some? Um, so they are, so kind of talking about the reproduction. So they do this, depending on the shark species, they do things very similarly to our uh, skates and race. So they can do the, vi the viviparous, which means live birth. Um, they can do the oviparous, which is the egg case. They put it on the ocean floor, so like that mermaid's, pace, uh, mermaid's purse, and it sits there for a certain amount of time until it begins to hatch. Um, here is a pregnant, I believe this one was, ooh, a great white perhaps? I don't remember, but she was very, very pregnant. Look at that swollen belly. Um, this up top is an egg case right there that the horn shark will make. Um, ovo viviparous, this one gets crazy. So basically, they have eggs that are inside the uterus, so inside the mama. Then the eggs hatch, and then they kind of feed on each other, which is a little messed up. So they kind of go after their siblings. Um, so the great whites will do it, nurse sharks, tiger sharks, pelagic thresher sharks, Greenland sharks. Um, that's kind of a little messed up, I think. But hey, survival of the fittest, right? They start, start them young, teach them young. Um, and then this one is the craziest. This is called parthenogenesis. And this is when a female can actually give birth without coming in contact with a male. Um, so they have documented it in a couple sharks. So the bonnet heads, the black tips, and the zebra sharks. I know for sure they've documented it in aquariums, that they've seen it happen and they don't know why. Um, I don't know if they've documented it out in the wild yet, but it's just, it blows my mind. I still don't understand. I'm like, why is that? A, I understand why it's a good option. Cause like, if you don't find a mate, well, okay, I can do it by myself. But like, I just don't understand if there is a mate because the zebra shark, I believe the aquarium was over in Japan where they documented it. There was a mate in the tank with her, but she was like, nope, because they tested the DNA and it was all from her. So that just blew my mind. She's like, I don't need you. I got this. I'm a strong, independent woman. I like it though. Um, down here on the bottom left is actually, I believe that is a nurse shark. Yes. So that is a nurse shark giving birth. Um, this was like one of the few times that someone actually was able to record this happening. So sharks, like I said, they like to hang out alone. Sometimes they, they just don't want anything to do with us, right? And a lot of them are gonna be out in the open ocean because they do, they swim for a very, very, very long time. So we just don't know a lot about them because they are so mysterious. They do like to hang out by themselves. 
And if they come across us, they're like, eh, goodbye, and they take off. Um, so this was a really cool thing that scientists were able to do. Um, and now with the increase in technology, so drones especially, things like that, where we don't have to have humans out in the water, we can kind of be out there without us being out there, we're able to learn a lot more stuff. Um, so some of the biggest threats really quick, and then this will be my last slide, I believe, and then we'll take questions. Um, so overfishing, especially. So they are used um, shark finning. So that is like one of their biggest threats. Um, people think that's a problem only in Asia, but we actually, as long as you are three miles offshore, the coast of Florida, so as long as you are in international water, you actually can go catch sharks and um, get the fins and bring them back. That's technically not illegal. So that's one of the hard things with the ocean, right? Because it could makes up the entire planet and there are so many different countries that do so many different things. Why would a landlocked country in the middle of Europe have shark protections, right? Why, they're like, we don't, we don't live by the water. Why would we want to? Uh, but for us, the US, like we only three miles and then anything past three miles, technically you can do it. Um, so shark finning is a huge thing. Also, they, um, the oils. So for a long time, there was this myth that sharks couldn't get cancer. So we actually would take the liver and take the fatty oils from it and make these shark pills so to help us. Most of the time, if they're taking things from animal for medical reasons, it's not true. Just eat your vegetables, I promise, and get eight hours of sleep. I promise you'll be fine. Um, so a lot of it has to do with that overfishing. Bycatch also. So bycatch is when, let's say, it's a big trawl net that's trying to catch sardines. Um, but that net's not like, oh, you're a sardine, come in. And then the net's like, oh, you're a turtle, skip away, right? The net doesn't discriminate. The net just takes whatever is in its path. So unfortunately, bycatch is when you're aiming for a certain uh, animal, but unfortunately, you're catching these other things as well. So like here. So remember, most sharks have to swim to breathe. If they get all sorts of tangled in here, are they going to be able to breathe? Probably not. Um, habitat degradation. So most of their threats are human caused. <laughs> um, so as we, um, especially seagrass beds and mangroves, things like that, as we kind of destroy them, whether it's because of pollution or because we're building or boat activity, whatever, we're taking away these places that the animals need, like nurseries and uh, breeding grounds, things like that. Climate change, um, so that's something that is affecting everything. So as our oceans get more acidic because it's keeping more carbon dioxide in the ocean, how is that gonna affect the sharks? Um, will it change where their food is? Will they now be going into areas? Will they be going further north than Nova Scotia? Who knows? Um, and then one of the biggest problems with them is their reproduction. So they're slow growing, they're late to mature, and they usually don't have too many babies at a time. So if we're taking so many out, so many out, so many out, and the population is only slowly increasing, if we take too much and not enough is being replenished, we could run out. So what can we do? Because we got to swing it back to the positives. Education and awareness, right? We, like, if you don't know about things, you're not going to care about things and you're not going to change your behavior, right? So that's what we do here. We want to teach you guys about how fantastic the ocean is and why we all need to love it and save it because it is the best thing ever. Um, so that's what we do here. Being mindful consumers, so making sure you're avoiding things with shark products because shark products are in a lot of things that you wouldn't expect. Um, also supporting sustainable fisheries. So the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which is located in Monterey, California, they have this thing called the Seafood Watch where um, you can go on their website and they tell you what kind of fish you should be eating. So wild caught is obviously better than farm fish. And then there are certain fisheries that are more stable than other ones. Um, in the Northeast, we had the cod fishery collapse 10, 15, I don't know, longer than that now. What year are we in? 2020. <laughs> so like, I'm like, where am I? So like 20, 30 years ago, we took out way too much. They weren't reproducing. We didn't know much about their reproduction strategy. Um, and we took out way too much and that fishery collapsed. So fisheries management is really important too. Um, just being aware of their reproduction, how often, how many, et cetera, et cetera, how long it takes for them to be considered adults, um, things like that. And one thing that we can do is we can contact our local legislators um, to pass legislation uh, protecting sharks, banning shark finning, et cetera, et cetera, sign petitions, all that good stuff, because your voice is necessary. Sometimes it feels like our voice isn't heard and our voice doesn't matter in the grand scheme of the world, but it does. We just need everyone to get on board with it. All right, and so any, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I just have a comment. I wanna know if any of our girls what do you, so you can answer in the chat yes or no do you think that canada does a lot of shark finning does anybody know someone's asking why do they only eat the fins that's uh, that's a great question i'll get to that in a sec so canada 
because if you think about all of our oceans around us, we used to do a ton of shark finning and we mm -hmm. would export all of those shark fins mostly to Asia because mm -hmm. there's a, a food dish there they really like to eat and it's called shark fin soup. And the reason they only want the fins is because inside the fins, there are these little um, kind of bonier bits. And what they do is those kind of have a similar texture to noodles in a weird way, but they don't mm -hmm. taste like anything. They don't have any flavor. No. And so, you know, they do this really horrible thing, cutting fins off of a shark and putting the rest of the carcass back in the water to, to die slowly. And then they take this shark fin, they dry it out, they turn it into a soup. But the weirdest thing is that because there's no flavor, they have to flavor it with other things. So they put like chicken stock and beef bits in it. So it just doesn't make any sense to me. Right. Just but gives what's amazing is that just this past year, Canada banned the export of uh, shark fins. So that's oh, a really, really huge, amazing thing for Canada to have done. That means that uh, you can't sell shark fins to other countries around the world if you're in Canada. So I just wanted to mention that since all of us are, are calling it. That's awesome. Canada. Yeah. And like you said, yeah, there is no flavor to those cartilaginous noodles. Like they have to add the onion, the garlic, the spices. They have to add all that stuff to make it delicious. It is considered a delicacy over there. So it shows um, your class and wealth status, but you could just put like glass noodles or spaghetti noodles. and There's no difference because there is a no medical benefit and be no taste. Um, and then like you had said, so they cut the fins off and throw the shark back. Now what what did we say that sharks need to do in order to breathe? Swim, right? So if you're cutting the fins off and throwing the shark back, what do you think is going to happen to that shark? Yeah, it's not good. Um, so a lot of it is just people. So I blame Jaws, that movie. It's all its fault, really. So in the 70s, when that movie came out, it made everyone terrified of sharks. And we kind of viewed them as these man-eating machines. Like that's the, oh, they only want to eat humans, right? So they have that narrow, negative, negative stereotype and that movie just kind of ruined it for everyone because now like immediately we're, from a young age, we're like, oh, we're scared of sharks. I don't want to go in the water because there might be a shark, but like they want nothing to do with us. Like I said, kitchen toasters, uh, playgrounds, barbecue grills, uh, roller coasters, snakes, dogs, those are all more dangerous. Sharks kill anywhere from, I believe it was seven people last year. I think it was five in 2018. So less than 10. We kill over 100 million sharks every year. And that's a very generous estimate. I've heard up to 500 million sharks. So it is insane the amount of sharks that we are killing because they really don't want anything to do with us, but they are such a crucial piece to that nature puzzle out there. And if we take them away, that's just gonna cause all sorts of other issues within that marine food web. So does anybody have any questions? I know we're kind of getting towards the end of time. I just wanna make sure I heard everyone who wants to say things. Who can we write letters to to support banning shark fin harvesting? So uh, as I mentioned, that's no longer something that really happens very commonly in Canada because we cut it out. Um, but in terms of other countries, I mean, I don't know. Do you have an answer for that, Carly? Like in the States, it's still legal. Yes. Yeah. So we would have to write to either our local um, county members or write to our, because our government is all sorts of layers. Um, we could also write to our Congress representatives, whether it's the House of Representatives or the Senate. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Florida is a little bit behind on the times. We're not as progressive as we think we are. So actually, here's something cool you can do. If you travel to different parts of the world, let's say you go to Asia, so Japan, South Korea, China, um, those are the countries that they do a lot of shark finning. Um, it's really easy to actually, while you're there, kind of go into a little shop and find shark fin soup. So a perfect thing that you could do if you come to this is don't order it don't buy it, right? Every time you buy something, you spend your money, you're voting. You're saying, I'm okay with this practice. I'm okay with this. So you can discourage friends from doing that. You can make sure that you're not supporting it. Um, if you learn about some of these like weird, uh, Carly showed a, a, a photo of a bottle of shark liver oil pills. Yes. Once again, that doesn't do 
anything at all, people have just read the wrong information or someone's tricked them. So I think what Carly said that's great is awareness, right? So you guys now have more knowledge than probably a lot of the people around you about shark stuff. So now you have the ability to educate other people. So really quick, I'll just give you a brief background about what we are uh, before we get going. So the MEEC, the Marine Environmental Education Center, is located in Hollywood Beach, Florida. So we are in South Florida, right between Fort Lauderdale and Miami. Um, Florida is beautiful. We have such an amazing uh, marine ecosystem here and terrestrial ecosystem as well. Um, but we are about three years old as a facility. Um, this house, we are actually located right on the beach. Um, so literally right behind me where you see those palm trees, that's all dune area. And then the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean is right over there. So a hop, skip and a jump away. Um, so the family who owned this house, uh, the Carpenter family, they, Mrs. Carpenter passed away in 2002. And before she passed away, she put the house in a trust. And because um, here in South Florida, there's a lot of development, a lot of high rises. Um, there aren't many dune systems just because we love living on the coast here in Florida. Um, this area is super unique, especially in South Florida, because we're in like this little stretch of paradise. Um, so we do have the sea grape trees, we do have the sea oats, we have the dune system still here. So it's really cool. It's like this calmness within the chaos of South Florida. Um, and the owners knew that. And when Mrs. Carpenter passed away, she wanted this to continue, this little oasis. Um, so Broward County, the local government here, bought the house. And um, the stipulations in the trust were it had to stay as is, so you couldn't knock it down, couldn't build high rises, and she wanted it to benefit the community somehow, some way. Uh, the carpenters were really involved with the community, uh, local politics, environmental causes, and even art as well. Um, so we've kind of taken all of that and made it into one big thing here. Um, it was just operating as a historic home for a little bit until Broward County partnered with Nova Southeastern University, so one of the local universities here, um, and that's when we opened the education center. So we opened up in March of 2017. And the goal is for anyone who comes through our doors that they learn something um, about the ocean, whether it's specifically about turtles. And you guys might meet Captain when we have more programs with you later this uh, next month, because we're still in July. Um, but we have a resident green sea turtle who's kind of the star of the show. It's a self-guided tour. You walk in, we have an interactive cabana exhibit where you get to learn a little bit about shark tagging, shark tracking, things like that. Um, uh, TED, so turtle excluder devices. A um, little bit about the research that goes on at NOVA with some of the corals and lionfish. And then you can actually come in and view the home as well. Uh, we work with local school groups. So they usually come to us for field trips and we are all about hands-on learning. Um, so when you guys come to us, we have everything set up and you guys get to, we just, as the educators, we just kind of help you if you need some guidance. But for the most part, you guys are in charge of your learning here. Um, so it's a little different now virtually because we don't have that hands-on component. So it's just a lot of me talking at you. Um, but this stuff, it's so fascinating. So if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to type it in the chat or we can hold it. And I might, I'll try and keep an eye on it as we go. Um, but if you don't type it in the chat, but you do have a question, write it down, save it for the end, because I will leave time for us to get it there. So if you guys are ready, we're going to go ahead and get started. <laughs> 